In her iconic song of 1957, Patti Page sang the now famous line, you're sure to fall in love with old Cape Cod. Whether for Patti's description of dreamy sand dunes and lobster stew, or the memories of endless summers, visitors to the Cape will now remember the Cape Cod Happy Hour. Hot summer days and wild summer nights on old Cape Cod. But it's the time in between that created this phenomenon. When the magic light of late afternoon hits the afterglow sunburnt faces. The two for one special, music, certainly the laughter, and hormones bouncing off the walls with the rest of the acoustics. We called it happy hour. I'd really like to explain it, but in the end, you just had to be there. So here it is, the story of the Cape Cod Happy Hour and the legends that made it happen. The Kings of Cape Cod. Going to Cape Cod was really all about getting the rental house, and that would start around February. want to find out who was going to go in on it, who was going to pay, and because we'd always have weekend guests come down, and those folks are the folks that would pay as you go. There were only going to be about six names on the lease, of course, but there's about 12 girls, and it was all about scoring that house. When we first started going down, uh, it was pretty exciting because uh, it was the place in the summer that you went to. Everyone went to the Cape. You rented cottages, and I had rented cottages with kids before. There'd be 10, 20, even 30 perhaps in a house. The Cape back then, and this is the late 70s, was really predominantly vacation rentals. Uh, the year-round population was very small. So uh, as much money as we could garner together as a group of guys, we had eight guys. You know, we found the place not too far from the Crystal Palace where, you know, we could, we could, we could stay for the summer was on a little, you know, sandy road, um, sort of a one, you know, one floor cape with three bedrooms and one bathroom. And, uh, you know, we all scraped and scrounged together to come up with a couple of hundred bucks each to, to rent the place for the summer. So, you know, back then you could rent a, a, a place for $1,500, $2,000 for the whole summer. Um, it wasn't a Taj Mahal to, in any extent, but it was a place where we could, uh, you know, sleep at night and take a shower before we went to work. The living conditions when we had rented houses, some of the big houses, yeah. was fine. There were plenty of bedrooms, bathrooms, and everything else. But, you know, we did the, also the hotels that you crammed as many people as you could, <laughs> which yeah. is an issue when you're trying to get, like, five girls ready mm -hmm. to go to happy hour. I mean, that was the epicenter of, 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 a, of a weekend warrior, we used to call them, the people that came to the Cape. Why don't we go on the beach? When are we getting off the beach? When are we going to the packy to get that pregame beer? And then what time are we getting to happy hours so we can get in line and we gotta get in? Happy hours originally started about cheap drinks. And then the entertainment thing just moved it along. But the word happy hour belongs to the discounted drinks and they had them everywhere. That's what happy hour was. It had nothing to do with, with guys like us doing the guitar, sing-alongs and a few jokes and, and, and some of our own songs and, and, and we were basically social directors and, um, and what we were doing was selling booze big time. For over 50 years Dick Darty has been entertaining in the greater Boston area in one form or another. His happy hour start came in 1963 on Cape Cod at Charlie's Prospector Inn in Hyannis. Dick Darty was a hustler, moving from blanket to blanket on the beach during the day to spread the word about his show. He was planting the seeds that would become the phenomenon of happy hours on the Cape. Dick Darty to me, could have been a Dion. You know, he, he could have been in the recording business. He was that good of a singer. I mean, it's what I wanted to do since I was four years old. I had an Italian uh, aunt that used to say, everybody shut up, Dick's gonna sing a song. God love her. <laughs> I was a waiter for a while at Thompson's Clam Bar up in Hollage. And then I saw Rocky King. He would play the show tunes and then he'd stop 
and he'd do 15 minutes of jokes. Then he'd start another song and everybody starts singing. And I said, geez, I could do that at happy hour. The Crystal Palace, um, it had been an, um, an Elks Hall. It had been an Elks Hall and we remodeled it and, um, and it held legally, I think about 200 people, but we would put 500 in. And what we would do is, <laughs> we would paint yellow lines on the floor. And, and so when the building inspectors came, everybody had to be behind the lines so that the fire department could walk through nice and easily. And they said, well, if you can get through, it's all right. <laughs> and, and they'd call and tell me they were coming, so <laughs> those were the good old days. So I came up with the idea for the happy hour thing, and I went down the beach, and I got blanket to blanket, and, and made friends with a bunch of guys from um, Charlestown and Selfie. That was the core of my group at first. Then the next year I went up to work for the Fitzgeralds at the Mill Hill Club. And the same thing happened. First day, bang, packed. I had no guitar amp, no microphone or anything when I first started. I just did Hey Lottie for hours and hours. But we were the only game in town, so we were packed. I used to have a song. Uh, it was a Kingston Trio song. Uh, someday the world I used to know will come along and bid you go. But until then you change your mind but then till then I'll blow you, I'll blow your mind. But till that day, I'll be your man. And then the crowd on their own wrote, I'll blow your socks off if I can. And it became a big thing. We had buttons with little white socks on them. Uh, when I did the happy hours up in Boston, I went before Tip O'Neill, because he thought that was offensive. I'll blow your socks off. And he wanted to take the license away from all of us, which is now the Cassian Flagon. Um, but, they did that thing, and they started calling me Dirty Dick. Now, I gotta tell you, in those, in those days, Dirty Dick, I wasn't dirty, I was naughty. Chasing rainbows through the fields. The reason I made it wasn't because I'm any great talent, but I was a hustler, a marketer. So I was great at putting bodies in the room. And I knew how to play a crowd so that they'd bring their friends. Because, like, if you, if, when the Southie crowd came in, they always represented like 50 people. And there were two or three of them that were really nice to me and really good people and that I liked. So, therefore, I would play with them and then the Charlestown crew. And then I would get the Charlestown crew going against the Southie crew. And then, then the Medford people would get involved. And it was, um, yeah, it was, yeah. I really loved it. And a man needs love. A typical happy hour day would be we'd hang out on the beach, we'd have a few cocktails, get in the afternoon started, and then it would be okay, someone's gonna start showers now. Because who's gonna be first? We all gotta be ready. We have to leave. Bye. Three. We have to get a table. And it would, it was. It was somewhat of a military sort of thing, like you next, you next, who's in what to order, who takes longer, it's going to take Joanne longer to dry her hair, whatever it was going to be, but it was, uh, it was pretty organized. Uh, very rarely did you get an opportunity, uh, you know, to really, you know, shower and look neat. That, that wasn't it back in the day. You, you, it was come as you are to happy hour, uh, because you were going to get beer spilled on you. you I mean, it was going to be a sweaty mess anyway. So uh, there was no really dressing up for happy hour. If anything, it was dressing down. The most successful businessman of any of us was John Morgan. He really learned how to make money uh, owning a, a Cape Cod comedy club. Says maybe later. <laughs> well, I'm willing, I'm willing. Yes, sir, here we go, now, here we go. Oh. The high, working on the railroad yeah. Yeah. all the live long day. Yeah. High, working on the railroad. Yeah. 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 Grew up in Natick, Massachusetts. 
and would sing on the shores of Lake Cotituate and everybody would like me and I'm a people pleaser. I like to be liked. 1963, Dick Doherty was singing at a, a, a little bar dive on the way to Craigville Beach called Charlie's Prospector Inn. And I walked in there and Dick was on stage. The place was jammed to the rafters. Everybody's laughing and singing and, and uh, even uh, I got up and uh, I grabbed the guitar during one of his breaks and I sang a little bit, a few songs that I knew, and, I get, and that's when I said, hey, this is for me. Well, my first appearance at the Crystal Palace was back in 1974. And I sang there every summer and we decided to do a Wednesday happy hour and everybody says, no, no one's gonna come to a happy hour on a Wednesday and we would have the place jammed Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. On the big weekends, it was uh, a phenomenon that I've never seen in my life. Um, people literally left the beach early, cleaned up, and headed over to the parking lot and started tailgating, just like they were at a Patriots game, waiting for us to open the door an hour before John would even go on so they could even get in and get a spot upstairs. Everybody wanted to be a bartender, and people would come down and they'd have to be, we, if you didn't get there early enough, you were put in the cellar at the Crystal Palace. Nobody wanted to be in the cellar. So Norm, Dick Doherty said, Norm, you could have a job here as a bartender. He said, no, I'm happy on the back door. Well, the people from Boston would come down and say, don't put us in a cellar. Don't put us, in, here's a hundred bucks. We don't want to get in the cellar. He was making $800 a day on the back door, <laughs> collecting tips for getting people in. He goes, well, let me shake your hand, and maybe this will change things. So uh, he shook my hand, and inside my hand was six $100 bills, and this was 1979. And uh, I shook his hand and said, uh, welcome to the Crystal Palace. Enjoy yourself. Get your hands up, August 14th, 1980, I announced to everybody, next year, folks, I'll have my own place. And I tried to buy the Crystal Palace from Dick Doherty, but he was very happy there. And, so I went out and I built Puffer Bellies, which I knew would be a home run, and it turned out to be a grand slam. It was phenomenal. One of his big themes when he'd start off the show was he'd start off with the song, I don't want to work. I don't want to work. You know, I want to bang on the drum all day. And he'd be telling everybody, we're not going to work tomorrow. We're blowing off work. And he'd get the crowd going in that way. And then that's how things would get started from there. We had a line out the door and I would sing to 1,500 to 2,000 people every Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, and people said, where do they come from? And they came from everywhere. At its peak, Puffer Bellies, the cars would start coming in the parking lot at noontime. And by the time John Morgan went on at three or four in the afternoon, I mean, we had 2,000 plus people in there and stuffed, crammed, sweating, dancing together and having a great time. My role at Puffer Bellies was basically to warm up for John Morgan, get the crowd looped up into a frenzy, play a few songs. You know, I played the same songs every Saturday, every Sunday, and every Wednesday afternoon that just got the people ramped up, and when John came on, he just took off like a shot. The reason Happy Hours was so big, in the 60s and the 70s, there were no cell phones. If you were coming to Cape Cod, and you wanted to meet up with your other friends, you had to say, hey, listen, I'll meet you at the Improper Bostonian, I'll meet you at the Mill Hill Club, I'll meet you at the Crystal Palace, I'll meet you at Puffer Bellies. If you didn't meet them there, you might not see them all weekend long. Right, here we go now. Raise your glasses in the summer of 1984. I think for all of us, we weren't the, the entertainer and the audience, we were just like Mitch Miller, the leader of a, a, a sing-along. We were all together, and the people could tell that. You know, they, they, weren't, they never thought that they were better than anyone else. They were just in the group, and the audience was the rest of the group, you know.
You know, a lot of people think sometimes that they don't want to do sing-along, it's not cool. Well, these were the fine athletes and the great people, and yet they'd be arm in arm singing. Nobody felt that it was below them to sit there and enjoy themselves. And we did enjoy ourselves. I couldn't wait for Fridays to come. We couldn't wait for Fridays to come. We all worked during the week. Um, and Friday afternoon came, my car was packed, and phew, right down to the Cape. Sometimes we'd go down on a Saturday afternoon, if we were in traffic on Route 3, trying to get to that bridge, maniacal. Yeah, there was a lot of traffic and a lot of police. You had to be careful of the police, because they'd be in the, they'd be backed up on the medians, back up into the hills and the pine trees. And, uh, and you had to be careful, because you'd be drinking on the way down the Cape. It's, Alcohol flo flowed freely. You know, that ride down in the van, and you'd hit about five miles out, and it was stop and go to the bridge from there, you know, trying to talk to all the girls in the cars beside you. And I would sit there with my drums in the back, and I'd have my drumsticks be banging on the, uh, on the dashboard. Going over the bridge to a happy hour was like, entering the pearly gates or something. You know, it was like going to the Garden of Eden. The anticipation would build, and then finally, once it was almost like a relief valve, once you started climbing up the Sagamore, and it was a little bit of a break in the traffic, and you felt that euphoric feeling, here I am, I'm on vacation, I'm on the Cape. This is a Cape Cod love song. I've been singing on 10 years. I've been singing this. A native song. of West Roxbury, Mass., Frank Sullivan, nicknamed DJ by his fraternity brothers, got his start playing guitar and singing songs at UMass Amherst beginning in 1970. DJ's name would start appearing at all the most popular watering holes, like McMahon's in Brighton and Studley's in Somerville. But where he really made a name for himself was on Cape Cod. Hey, this afternoon, come on out to Cape 104's last splash party of the season. It's the last splash, folks, at the Casino by the Sea in Falmouth Heights. When all of the happy hour guys were doing their thing, you know, in the beginning and strong, and everyone was going to see their favorite happy hour person, they were kind of going off the songs of one group, and that was the fabulous Farquhar. The Farquhar were the ones that wrote all of these songs that the Cape Cod Happy Hour guys all sang on stage every Saturday and Sunday afternoon. There was a group on the Cape very popular, the Farqua, the fabulous Farqua, and I got from them Carol, everyone sang that. Uh, My Eggs Don't Taste the Same Without You. Those were the two Farqua signature songs that we did at Happy Hour. Uh, they were funny. I liked everything humorous. Uh, I, didn't, I was not one who went to concerts to see serious musicians play serious songs, everything. Uh, so uh, I tried to be as funny as I could on stage myself. And uh, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. <laughs> My boss told me, come see this guy, DJ Sullivan. And I went over, he was there on Thursday night, so I went over and I, I started watching this guy and I just said, this guy's great. He, he, the thing I liked about DJ was he would attack anything. It was 1964, I remember completely because uh, I was watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And I thought it might be nice if I could become like a Beatle. <laughs> well, my first happy hour was at the Improper Bostonian. Uh, John Morgan moved along. This was the early 70s. And he went down to the Sandy Pond Club and they had a vacancy for the happy hours. And I was lucky enough to get the job. Every place you went, you didn't have enough room for the people. They were all out in line. So I would drive by the Mill Hill Club and that would be vacant. And so one day, I said, gee, this is a better venue for me. It's a bigger place. Tomorrow is Sunday. No one will be leaving Cape Cod because the heat wave is supposed to last through Monday. That means you call up your employer tonight. Don't wait till tomorrow. Tonight. You say, hey, I will see you Tuesday morning. I'm not coming home. I, I relied on every gimmick I could get my hands on. And the best way I could hold the audience, I thought, was getting audience participation. 
And so if they would come up and do the hokey pokey, uh, green alligators, uh, anything, or have someone come up and sing a song, the beauty of it was if they did a wonderful job, that was terrific. But if they were terrible, that was funny and terrific also. And my signature song was We're Having a Party, and uh, the whole place knew every word to it. And then the mystery, uh, it's audience participation, and that's what it was about with me. The, you felt the most gratified as a performer when you had the audience in the palm of your hand. That was the most important thing in a happy hour singer. You had to have a connection with your audience. It was more important than the actual music. So I remember one year in particular, we rented a big cottage and a small cottage. And the deal was that with eight or 10 guys staying between the two cottages, we made an agreement that if you hooked up that night, you got to stay in the small cottage. And believe me, everybody wanted the small cottage. Ten years ago, I was dating, you know, at the time, my husband. And um, I was, you know, all excited for him to come and go see uh, Jim Plunk at Happy Hour. And we went, and we had so much fun and everything else. And I said, so Charlie, I go, what did you think of Happy Hour? And he goes, I, like, I can't believe you thought I wouldn't like it. He goes, so there's good music, booze, and women in their bathing suits dancing up on stage. What part of it did you not think that I would like? <laughs> but most importantly, you know, it was the crowds inside. You were meeting people from New York or from the western part of Massachusetts and, and uh, from all over. The crowds were great. You know, you met a lot of people, uh, a lot of hookups, <laughs> and uh, it was just a lot of fun. One of, one of our friends always wanted to meet a biker. I mean, we were really a bunch of really nice, probably somewhat naive girls. So we were on the hunt for a guy with a motorcycle, and she was very excited. She came up to me at, at one point, and she said, um, I met a guy with a bike, and he's going to give me a ride back to the house on the back of his bike. And I said, that is so cool. So we all went out into the parking lot when the happy hour was over, and we wanted to see Sheila get on the back of the bike with a guy that she had met, and um, it was a Schwinn. A lot of people coming in right off the beach, girls with bikini tops on, um, shorts, running shorts, guys, you know, t-shirts, um, everybody having fun, everybody drinking. It was an absolute perfect scenario for guys to meet girls, and girls were, as active on the drinking side as the guys were. So everybody had a good buzz on. Um, tons of guys, you know, meeting girls. Some became girlfriends, some became wives. I was just so astounded that this guy fit my description perfectly. And I, I nudged my friend Charlene and I said, hey Charlene, see that guy in the far corner there with that orange t-shirt? I said, that's my perfect man. That's the guy I'm going to marry. And Charlene said, Stephanie, that's the guy I told you about. That's Gino. Send my toast to that too. My heart's in a shambles. I can't eat my scrambles. My eggs don't taste the same without you. From summer to summer to summer, you'd see people you had run into before. Yeah. And we, cut, we made some friends that way that we only would see in the summertime at happy hours. Then we'd go our separate ways for the winter and then. We knew we'd see them again next summer at a Jim Plunkett happy hour. We still see some of those yes. people, yeah. yeah. I mean, you had Puffer Bellies, you had the Mill Hill, and uh, the Improper Bostonian, of course, with Plunkett packing the place. You know, there'd be a line of 100 out the door waiting to get in with an hour left in the night. And they'd still pay the cover to walk in the door. Here's how you describe a Jim Plunk at happy hour. You go in the middle of the floor, okay, no seats. You know, the deal is you don't have any seats at happy hour or anything like that because you don't want people bending over. Yeah. So, the, so the lowest one is this high or no seats at all, preferably, yeah. okay? 
So you stand in the middle of a crowd, you take a beer, you open it up, you pour it on your head, okay, and you yell anything you want, as loud as you want, and no one will even notice. That's how I describe happy hour. I was going to art school, and I used to play, I used to play guitar all the time, and I was playing at a party in art school. It was New England School of Art. And uh, somebody came over and said, asked me if that was your real name, Jim Plunkett. And I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, look, I uh, run this place in Somerville called the Blarney Stone, and I just want to put your name on the marquee. I don't really care whether you play or not. I think it's a day at the beach. Now you got enough sun, still got a half an, you know, an afternoon left, and you still got the weekend, you're not working. They, that's a happy hour to me. After it was over, you could still go out. And I remember the guy at the Irish pub saying to me, I can always tell when they were at your happy hour, Jim Plunkett, because at 11 o'clock they're sleeping on my tables. So I thought that was, that was really funny. So. If anyone is the Iron Man of the Cape Cod Happy Hour, it's Jim Plunkett with his fun, get up and go approach to music. Early in his career, there was some confusion between Jim Plunkett, the football player, and Plunkett, the musician. But there's no confusion anymore. I started the Improper Bostonian in 1973 and haven't left yet. The Improper Bostonian was the first big one up at that end of the kick. It was just at the time that, that, that Happy Hours were getting gigantic and Jimmy went to the Improper Bostonian and just knocked the walls up. There's something about somebody playing live that is just adds that, I got human touch, and uh, you can't beat that. You just meet these kids and, and they'll, they'll get into it, you know, like, my mom was right, oh, I had so much fun, thank you, you know, and there's it, it, more to it than just the music. I mean, it's, it's what you present, it's, what your, it's your attitude, how you feel, you know. I, I like people, I don't like mean people, but I like people. He's just got that uh, charisma that, uh, you know, people love him. Happy Hour was about the performers, including people, like in the crowd. You were part of it. You were singing along with Plunkett. You were, you know, everything was, was about the crowd. That's my Happy Hour that I, I can remember. And I always thought Happy Hour was just something in the afternoon. A little, you know, almost like, um, what's the thing they use for, not for bread, a brunch. <laughs> it was almost like a brunch for drinkers, so, you know, in the afternoon. It's 1034 and you're chanting with Titus on Cape 104 WKPE. Later on this afternoon, I hope you'll join me with John Morgan at Puffer Belly's Happy Hour. Fun starts at 3, goes until 8. Come on down. My first happy hour experience was uh, probably a little before I was 21. I think I snuck my way in. I went in there with my cousins and uh, my friends. I went to go see uh, Gordy Milne, who at the time I thought his name was Gordy Mill. I thought that was his club. So I was pretty excited to get in there finally. Gordy was born in Vermont and moved to the small town of Dalton, Mass. when he was 10 years old. His first paying gig on Cape Cod was at Brothers Four in Falmouth, but he really got it going when he hit the tankard in East Falmouth. Gordy's big room came along in the form of the Mill Hill Club in 1984, where he took over for DJ Sullivan, who left for Pufferbellies. Gordy would rock the house at the Mill Hill Club for 17 years with his amazing skills at working the crowd with popular songs and skits. First appearance at a happy hour had to be a great club in Falmouth called the Tankard. 
Now everybody was headlining in that place. John Morgan was there, DJ Sullivan was there. And Jim Plunkett and I started out at this very same time. And we got jobs at the tanker. He started on Saturday night, I started on Sunday afternoon. It's my first happy hour. I got my start in the musical business and I really wouldn't call it musical business, I call it the happy hour business. Um, watching my brother play and went to college, went to UMass, and that's when it all started. You know, just drinking with my frat brothers, sorority sisters, having a great time, just singing anything at all that would pop up. And uh, that led to going to work in clubs and making some money. You know, 50 bucks a night. Wasn't bad at that time, a long time ago. So that's how I got my start in the musical business. My influence was my brother. You are the green alligator queen of the afternoon, right? And the green alligator queen, right? Tradition is you have to flash the audience up here, okay? I did a number of uh, venues throughout the Cape. And, uh, you know, I did the Crystal Palace when uh, John Morgan left to open up Puffer Bellies. No one knew John had opened up Puffer Bellies. The place was absolutely packed. They didn't know me, and I really didn't know them. But I just, Dick said, just Dick Doherty was the owner at the time, right? And Dick said, just get up there and just do your thing. So I got up there and did my thing, and the crowd was into me. I couldn't believe it. I told everybody John was sick. I didn't tell him he had opened up a place down the road. But they finally found out. After my break, I went back on stage. There was probably like 10 people left. So they all went to Puffer Bellies. They all found out about John and Puffer Bellies. I worked at the Mill Hill for 17 years, <clears throat> Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, in the beginning, absolute craziness packed every Saturday and Sunday. Uh, unbelievable people. People were uh, there to have a good time, you know, and a crowd draws a crowd. And, you know, if you got there early, you get in. If you didn't get there early, you waited in line. And you probably waited a good hour in line to get in. But the style was basically shorts, Hawaiian shirts, you know, Jim Buffett was big, so everybody was, in, you know, into the parrot head thing. So, I mean, you come to my happy hour, everybody would be in a Hawaiian shirt. The girls would be in tight shorts, tank tops. I mean, it was pretty wild. The people, the energy in that place was just totally incredible. I mean, you get those people going, then you could slow it down, bring them back up again, get them going again, and everybody would be just standing up, going crazy. Um, what I thought made Gordy so popular was that he played to the crowd. I remember I had a spot further back in the audience, and slowly I worked myself up through seniority. I got closer up to the stage, had a nice little spot up front, and Gordy would play to the crowd. He would uh, involve you. The more he saw you, the more he played to you. So it was, a, it was a job to try to get there as much as you can so you got some time on stage. He'd pull you up and have you do something stupid or have a drink or, or mess around and have some fun up there. So. Good young man, he comes here all the time. Now I heard he likes the ladies, but sometimes he'll take a guy. Hey, you guys, hey, oh, oh, he's all dressed up tonight and looking kind of spick. But I heard he has a bamboo, like a little toothpick. Oh, the big bamboo hooks big and tall. The big bamboo hooks the whole round off. The big bamboo stand up big and tall. The big bamboo hooks the whole round off. Yeah, well, I went to a couple other happy hours. But I, I, said, uh, I said to you before that I felt like I was cheating on Gordy. I felt like that was my home base. I thought that he was uh, some rock star, some superstar. I had to go to the Mill Hill Happy Hour. Um, so if I went someplace else, it was only on the way home. Gordy was probably about maybe five or eight miles from my house. So we would go there, and then as we uh, thought it was time to start going home, we'd head closer to our house. So that was the only reason I went to anybody else. We're too busy 
Born in Montclair, New Jersey, Cliff Myers moved to Rhode Island at the age of six and spent most of his life in Coventry. Cliff cast aside the saxophone for a guitar at the age of 14 after he heard his first Beatles song, and the rest is history. Cliff got what seemed to be the happy hour singer invitation shift, doing 25 cent beer nights on Mondays at the Improper. He worked a great deal in popular spots like Rascals and the Mill Hill Club until he landed what would be his most steady employer, John Morgan and Puffer Bellies. Cliff's an entertainer, guitar player, bass, drums, all at the same time, but it's the connection with the crowd that, that's what sets him apart. He brought video in well before YouTube. People love video, and he would, the old days of putting one VCR with another one and making tapes and bring him to the show and starting the show off with some comedy clips. Then during the show, it'd be the Brady Bunch. And then people would snap to the Adams Family. And then right at, I think it was the end, Hawaii Five-0, they would all run to the dance floor and pretend they were rowing. And they'd be going further and further back as they were rowing. People from all over New England, all coming for the same reason, have a good time. In the afternoon, late afternoon, happy hour. Well. I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, and I was hooked. I want to do this. I want to do this somehow, some way. So I picked up my first guitar. It was at Sears. It was an old silver tone that my dad got me, and so that was that was the beginning of it. Well, when I did the Cape, my I broke off with video. That was a big part of my show from the Flintstones, you know, on up, uh, Brady Bunch, you know, people, I played a video in back of me and people would respond to that. And right along with it, that dance in the aisles or to, uh, to a Gilligan's Island, because uh, they know it, it's familiar. If something's familiar and you, you, you throw it out there, they'll, they'll back you on it. Cape was a natural for uh, a natural extension of college play. I do the schools in the fall and spring, the different colleges, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Gordy did that same thing, and I, I think Jimmy did too. Where you'd go to all the all the schools. I mean, I can't even think of a school I didn't do, and they would follow you. Those students would follow you to the Cape, so you had a built-in crowd, which was fantastic. If you connect with them, if you connect with the crowd out there, you know, wherever they are, front, back, doesn't matter, they'll, they'll connect. They want to sing along. People want to be, I have found that to be true. They want you to lead them. They don't want to just sit back. Give them something to latch onto, and they'll never let you down. The country wasn't as divided. We talked about the president, but it was like Ronald Reagan's, and people just laughed and, and moved on. Everybody got along but we showed up at the nightclubs just to have fun, to have a happy hour, to, to forget it, not to dwell on it, to work on our, what makes us similar, not a different. We had a, it was a great time. And no, I don't think it'll ever come. I hope it comes again, but I don't think so. We, we never rehearse, so it's just you show up and basically we just follow John, you know, JD. There was a Sunday night at the Scotch and Sirloin, and I was there, and I said, Rich, you've got to see these guys. They're funny, and they're doing 60s, because people still doing the 50s music. But I saw the new generation, who was one of the 60s oldies. Um, he literally came up that night, and after that, for the next four or five weeks, we followed them and brought tape recorders and recorded everything they did. Sorry, JD, but uh, we taped everything. It's like... Uh getting into one of the, the bull riding things in the rodeo. You know, you, you get on the bull, you open the gate, and then you just go <laughs> wow. wherever it takes you. I started in around 1964, actually, in playing in different bands that, that we were doing Beatles, 65, 66, playing on the Cape. As word spread that the band was okay, clubs down on the Cape said, maybe we could try this on, a, on an off time, an afternoon, a happy hour, as opposed to a night when we're always packed anyway, and so we went down and it worked out pretty well at several places and kept uh, snowballing. It was a happier time, I think. 
people probably. would drink and be merry, I suppose, and dance. And well, because they were all single. That's yeah. that part of it, too. <laughs> I love that dirty water. Shoes were one of the most popular Cape Cod bands of all time. Bringing big crowds to fever pitch with their wild music and zany antics, the Shoes were known for being able to switch tunes at a moment's notice to please the crowd. The Shoes were formed in uh, 1980. 1980. Um, Rich Skelly and I uh, got together and uh, started the band when I had seen J.D. Billy and Ken. And we were the new kids on the block. So uh, the two for one got a lot of people there. But in the beginning, it was very slow. Uh, there were quite a few days when we were playing for ourselves. Um, and and uh, it, it just built from there. But that's where the shoe shot was invented. Now, there's a lot of different acts that uh, did happy hours. Um, uh, the shoes were a great act that, uh, when I worked at Celebrities as a bartender. And uh, <clears throat> the shoes had their own stick. Uh, they would um, prompt people to do what they called shoe shots. So people would take their smelly sneakers off, run up to the stage, they'd pour shots of peppermint schnapps in their shoes and do shots out of their, their smelly sneakers. So over the time that they did that, their following started to bring different apparatus in, power tools, garden tools, and would do shots off of basically anything. Going out to the parking lot and bringing tools from their trunk or ripping benches out of the wall from the, from the club that we're at, and using body parts. Sneakers, uh, wallets, pocketbooks, ashtrays. You know, I'd, I'd go home, do a novena, try to get that memory out of my mind, and uh, move on, you know, but uh, it, it was great. It was great to see somebody do that, I gotta admit. Mm -hmm. Gladiator before the gang bang. Oh, yes, he is. Because the gang bang is him. At the very end, they kind of cutting the mill hill down. Uh, people didn't go up on the top of the balcony. They started putting up these small petitions. So it made it seem a little more uh, cozy because it was less people. And Gordy would often say that there's a bus of people coming. So when Gordy had a break, I'd go up and say to him and say, hey, where's that bus of people? I'd go, so they're coming. They're going to be here. It's a good thing you got here in time because that big bus is coming. But Towards the end, that bus never came. Yeah! <laughs> I hope you don't use that, man. Its time had come. That's the way I look at it. Its time had come and passed. It, it was time. Uh, the drinking laws, without question, had a lot to do with it. You know, no longer was it cool. Uh, one for the road, that was a big thing back in the day. You, you don't hear that much, you know, hey, how about one for the road? No, no, it's, let's cut it off for the road. When we were kids, we'd come here, and I think a kid could work on the Cape and make enough money to pay his room and board and half his college expenses. Today, I don't think you could even pay your room and board. Happy hour and life as we knew it simply changed. The way life always does. But we are still linked together by a time in our lives that we loved so much. The friendships and bonds, the marriages and children that have all come from these events are just a testament to what can happen when people set aside their troubles in this crazy world and just spend a few hours with their best buds singing and smiling and making memories. We never ever, there was not the sense there is in, around now, but I'm, he's my competition, he's my competition. We never thought of it that way. There was room for everybody. What I miss most is just that, that freedom of people being who they are and having a good time, shaking hands afterwards and going home and knowing that they're gonna come back again the next week. I think they call it the test of time. And it's definitely, this has been a test of time, so. It's quite a ride. I don't think I'm ever gonna retire, but if I ever die, folks, don't feel bad, just 
Raise your glasses and say we had fun. <laughs>